If you were to list the first 46 things that come to mind when you think of Russia, chances are rugby would not be on the list. And yet, in amongst vodka, Dostoevsky and topless winter horse rides are enough attributes that make you wonder, why isn't rugby on that list? Why is a sport all about big, hairy, often drunken, suspiciously conditioned men wrestling in a bid to take territory, assert dominance, and repress their rampant homosexuality not more popular in Russia? Frankly, you'd think the Russians would be into any sport where the USA is less of a global superpower than Scotland, but alas, rugby has a somewhat complicated history with anglicised smash ball. So, why isn't rugby bigger in the biggest country on earth, and what can we expect in this year's World Cup from a team who are very much small in the sport. Rugby's arrival in Russia predates the first Soviet soccer game by about eight years, making it the oldest non-indigenous sport in the country. However, despite having such a long time to ferment, Russia themselves are really to blame for never having the chance to cause any full-strength vodka headaches for rugby's big boys. Over the first half of the 1880s, rugby grew very quickly across the Soviet Union. Clubs popped up all over, working-class folk taking to it as a fun new flavour of violence. And then, in 1886, Someone at the top stepped in when it started to look like people might be having fun, and the police started to crack down on rugby, saying it was, and I quote, brutal and liable to incite demonstrations and riots. Because in Soviet Russia, rugby is hooligans' game played by hooligans. This led to rugby becoming an underground game for almost 30 years, with records implying only one match took place between 1888 and 1923, when a local team who apparently didn't exist played the crew of a British trading ship stopping off in Moscow in 1908. This crackdown was ended in the 20s, but the damage was done and the growth of the game was far slower. A national governing body for Soviet Union rugby was eventually formed in 1936 and plans were put in place for the national team to play their first game later that year. Instead, they played their first game in 1974. Over the following 10 years, the Soviets slowly established themselves as a solid tier 2 side, beating Italy in 1984 and gaining an invitation as such to the first World Cup. They, however, turned it down on political grounds, opening up a slot for Romania, a favour that would eventually be repaid 32 years later. This internal decision banished the Soviet Union to World Rugby's own Siberian wilderness. Nobody wanted to play them. A freshly unprestigious team located well out of the way, where conditions are perhaps a touch less fun than Fiji. And even after the breakup of the Union, Russia remained unfancied. Whilst the sport was played by a reasonable number of people across the country, it received absolutely no government funding until 2009, when Rugby Sevens gained Olympic status. From there, things rose quickly for Russia. They qualified for their first World Cup in 2011, and whilst they lost all four games in New Zealand, they scored a few terrific tries, three against Australia, three against Italy, and two against Ireland, and then defended incredibly well in a tight, low-scoring game against the USA that traded tries for tension, action for atmosphere, kind of making it a microcosm for the Cold War. However, in 2015, things got even colder, as Russia lost to Uruguay in qualifying and missed out on the tournament, and qualifying for 2019 when even worse. Russia barely made a peep in the European Championship, they weren't in the conversation for Japan, Georgia were already there, and the other slot was between Spain and Romania. It came down to the last game of the round robin, where Spain just had to beat heavy underdogs Belgium to book their flights far east. However, what they weren't counting on was drawing a Romanian referee for the match, who gave some, shall we say, questionable calls in favour of the waffle-munching bureaucrats. This gave Romania the last European slot, and Spain were not happy. They appealed to World Rugby for a rematch. Then, in true teen girl fashion, Romania complained that the Spanish started it because they'd fielded a player who wasn't qualified for Spain, and then Belgium sat in the corner, knowing better than to open their mouths. And this rolled on for several months, the sides just battering at each other, until World Rugby did some digging and realised, wait a second, in the official qualifying tournament, Romania, Spain and Belgium have all fielded ineligible players. All three were dock points, meaning Russia, out of nowhere, having never really been part of the conversation, found themselves in the World Cup. It's pretty much like the end of Hamlet. Everyone's squabbling over the crown, they end up killing each other, then Fortinbras turns up and is kind of like, oh, shit lads, guess I'm king of Denmark now. 
And whilst there was a certain irony to Russia being the country to profit out of a sporting scandal, and the fact that their two rivals were suspiciously struck off as shades of Stalin, Russia's presence at this year's World Cup is rather exciting. Whereas most smaller teams end up relying on vaguely competent forward packs to keep the score down, Russia are an attack-minded team who never compromise their style of play. In more localised terms, we're talking Bristol or the Sunwolves rather than Worcester or the Dragons. This Russian World Cup is about scoring as many points past the big boys as possible and any result going their way will be a bonus and responsible for plotting this points palooza is Russia's current coach a man by the name of Lynn Jones. Having made his name as an incredibly innovative coach with Neef in the 90s Jones developed a reputation for being a um an interesting man. In the past he's conducted media interviews with his cock out because he knew the cameras were only filming him from the waist up um he once pulled a young shane williams aside in training to ask him straight faced totally genuinely seriously how big his dick was there are all kinds of lynn jones stories floating around welsh rugby folklore and literally none of them will be heard on itv's early morning world cup coverage to his credit however jones approaches rugby with the same refreshing lack of respect for customs he apparently does conversation whilst jones's record with london welsh was kind of terrible. They tried interesting, exciting new things and were willing to throw mad passes at any point. And whilst this time with the dragons was also terrible, they 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 were literally the dragons. I don't know what anyone else would be expecting. They were they were shit, of course they were they were the dragons, but you know things got worse than we left, so maybe that's a positive. 21st century Lynn Jones teams don't often win, but they play like men unafraid to have their pants pulled down. Taking risks, playing highly original rugby with the kind of confidence only those happy to let the wangers wumble free can. This inclination for frostbite has seen them post big scores against Argentina A and World Cup rivals Japan, Canada and Uruguay in the last year. However, whilst points normally mean prizes, in Soviet Russia points mean very little at all because Russia frequently conceded significantly more than 40 points a game. And whilst Jones has stressed the importance of using his remaining time to properly condition his team, you worry there's only so much more cryotherapy can do for a team who basically grew up in a colonised fridge. Russia are a you score 4 tries, will score 5 type team, except whilst that's normally the plan, they usually let the opposition score 9 or 10. Russia haven't faced a tier 1 defence since 2011, but if they are to get any of those 4 or 5 tries past Ireland or Scotland, they'll be looking to a handful of standout players. As such an attack-focused team, a lot of those standout players are often found stood out on the touchline. The best-known name amongst them being former Northampton back and Russia's current captain, Vasily Artemyev, who spent three seasons flopping over in the corner of Franklin's Gardens and a few prior showcasing his distinctive burst of pace at Black Rock College in Dublin, whose other former alumni include Joey Carberry, Gary Ringrose and some nerd called Brian O'Driscoll. Elsewhere out wide, they have the looming presence of Denis Simplikevich, who's kind of like a Soviet George North, or George Northeast Europe, if you will, and someone who has the potential to become your new favourite player, German Davidov, a flappish flyer who can create something out of nothing. We also have Vladimir Ostrusko, who was very much a winger when he did all kinds of naughty things to the Australian defence in 2011, but these days is more comfortable in the centre, a versatile trait he shares with a potential midfield partner, Kirill Golinitsky, who is still in his first 10 caps and is in and out the team, but someone who impresses me every time I see him play. And up front, I point to prop Valery Morozov, a hard-working, dynamic shithouse bastard who's stronger than the best or worst vodka you've ever had, and the 100 caps of number 8 Viktor Greshev, a man with enough experience to fill 17 CVs. But most impressive for me is the underrated open side, Tahir Gajev, a fundamentally violent man. Gajev is the sort of absolute workhorse of a player who seems to always be in six places at once. Gajev carries with fury, he steals the ball for Russia like it's American state secrets, he clears out everything and he's seemingly always on the shoulder of whoever has the ball, whether it's to support them or to make a tackle that borders on cannibalism. I'm not a scout or a coach or anything of the sort, but I'd be surprised and frankly disappointed if by this time next year Gajev hasn't been snapped up to play pro by someone in one of Europe's big leagues. Because though there are many nations that come to mind before Russia when we think of rugby, that doesn't mean we should be leaving them out there in the cold any longer. They may not be the most prestigious, historic or I iconic team in this year's World Cup. They may have always been a team that nobody wanted to play, but this year they may just prove to be one that everybody wants to watch. Four more to go. That's it. There are 15 more of these on the channel. I'm trying to cover every team in the Rugby World Cup. When I started out trying to do this, when I initially said this, I did not think I was going to manage it. And yet here we are. Um, thank you to everyone for watching and thank you to everyone that supports us on Patreon because you've made this 
possible. Uh, as I said, when I set out, because the amount of time and effort involved in this, you know, so for this video, I had to not only research the history of Russian rugby, um, but I also ended up watching sort of 12, 15 games. I watched basically every game Russia played for the last like year and a half, two years, um, in order to, you know, get a feel for the players, get a feel for the team, etc. Um, that wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for you guys supporting my Patreon, if I wasn't able to focus on this primarily. So thank you very much for that. Thank you also to find a player um, who, if anyone is looking to, in the next hour, perhaps, you really fancy playing some racquetball. You can use the Find a Player app, you want to play some touch rugby, whatever. Uh, to help find people wanting to play sport near you. There's details floating around. There's a Squidge Rugby page if you want to join in. Some people, a couple of weeks ago, played tennis together thanks to using that password. So thank you very much for that. And thank you for watching. There'll be more coming up very soon as we rattle towards that thing starting in two months and one day. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, I think we, we, we had a huge job to come back and recover from the last week's poor performance against the USA.